Today, we're diving into an incredible journey, one that took millions of years to unfold. The story of how we, as humans, gained the ability to speak. Think about it. Right now, I'm telling you a story using words, and that's something that makes our species truly unique. But have you ever stopped to wonder how we got here? How did we evolve from simple grunts to full-blown conversations, podcasts, rap battles, and even Shakespeare? Sure, other animals communicate, whales, elephants, crows, but the human voice, it's next level. It's what allows us to share ideas, express emotions, and tell stories just like this one. And even though speech itself doesn't fossilize, our ancestors left behind clues, bones, skulls, and even the shape of their ears that help us piece together when and how we first found our voice. So where does this story begin? Some might say it started 400 million years ago when the first ancient tetrapods crawled out of the water, evolved lungs, and gained control over their breathing and tongues two essential ingredients for making speech possible. Or maybe it started around six to eight million years ago when our ancestors split from the lineage of chimps and bonobos. They can communicate, sure, gestures, facial expressions, even vocalizations, but despite decades of effort, they've never mastered speech like we have. So when did our ancestors actually start sounding human? Well, one of our biggest clues comes from a tiny but mighty bone found in a 3.3 million year old fossil of Australopithecus afarensis. This little structure is called the hyoid bone, and it might just hold the key to when our ancestors first began talking. The hyoid is a U-shaped bone tucked in your neck, just below your jaw. And here's the crazy part. It's the only bone in your body that doesn't connect to any other bone. Instead, it's suspended by muscles and ligaments, kind of like a floating anchor for your tongue. In modern humans, the hyoid plays a huge role in how we produce speech. But in chimps and other great apes, it also supports structures called laryngeal air sacs, which change how they vocalize. We're still not entirely sure what laryngeal air sacs actually do. Some scientists think they help primates amplify their calls, allowing them to be louder and call for longer without running out of breath. But these air sacs don't just make calls louder, they also create deep, low-frequency sounds and blend higher-pitched ones together, which would make human speech a lot harder to understand. Now, here's the kicker. When researchers examined the hyoid bone of Australopithecus afarensis, yep, Lucy's species, they found something fascinating. It didn't look like ours. Instead, it looked way more like the hyoids of chimps and gorillas. And that's a big deal because it strongly suggests that these early hominins still had laryngeal air sacs. In other words, Lucy's species probably couldn't speak like us. And guess what? That single hyoid bone is the only one we've ever found from any Australopithecine species. Which makes sense. It's tiny, fragile, and one of the rarest bones in the entire hominin fossil record. The next oldest hyoid fossils they don't show up until almost 3 million years later. By that time, Australopithecines had vanished, and our own genus, Homo, had emerged, some of them even making their way out of Africa into Asia and Europe. And that brings us to Cima de los Huesos, aka the Pit of Bones, a cave site in northern Spain that holds one of the biggest hominin fossil collections ever found. Among these fossils are the next oldest hyoid bones ever discovered, dated to around 450,000 years ago, belonging to a species known as Homo heidelbergensis. Now, these guys might be the common ancestors of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, or at the very least, close relatives of both. And while the H. heidelbergensis hyoids are incomplete, what is preserved looks a lot more like our hyoid than the one from Australopithecus afarensis, or any chimp for that matter. Which tells us one thing for sure, these hominins probably didn't have laryngeal air sacs anymore. But does that mean they could talk like us? Not necessarily. See, it's not just about the hyoid. Our ability to speak also depends on the shape and proportions of our vocal tract. Think of the vocal tract as being split into two sections. The mouth, the horizontal section. The pharynx, 
the vertical section between the mouth and the voice box. In modern adult humans, these two parts are about the same length, and that's what allows us to produce the three key vowel sounds, A, I, and U. And that's probably not a coincidence. These vowels are some of the most distinct sounds we can produce, making them less likely to be confused in speech. But here's the real question. Could our ancient relatives also produce these same vowel sounds? Well, some anthropologists have argued no. For years, researchers thought that Neanderthals had a shorter vertical segment in their vocal tract and a longer horizontal section. And that's a big deal, because if true, it would mean their speech was way less clear than ours. Think about it. Human infants and chimpanzees have short vertical vocal tracts, and because of that, they can't produce the same crisp, distinct vowel sounds that adults can. But remember that Cima de los Huesos site in Spain, the Pit of Bones? That place gave us a crucial piece of the puzzle. Scientists found one individual there with an almost complete skull and all seven neck vertebrae intact, a rare find. Using this, they reconstructed the proportions of the upper vocal tract. And guess what? The horizontal and vertical parts weren't that different in length. In fact, the proportions were more like those of a 10-year-old human child than an adult. And here's the key. 10-year-olds can make those distinct vowel sounds just fine, which means this hominin, who lived almost half a million years ago, probably could too. But what about the Neanderthals? Did they have this same setup? Well, when researchers reconstructed the vocal tract of a Neanderthal from France, one that lived around 120,000 years ago, they found something surprising. His upper vocal tract wasn't actually that different from ours. The horizontal section was slightly shorter than the vertical one, meaning he probably could produce the full range of sounds found in human speech. And the evidence doesn't stop there. Let's bring it back to that tiny but important bone, the hyoid. We've actually found two Neanderthal hyoids, and one of them, discovered in a cave in Spain, dated to around 43,000 years ago, was almost indistinguishable from a modern human hyoid. A second Neanderthal hyoid bone, dating back around 60,000 years, was discovered in Kabara Cave, Israel. And just like the one found in Spain, this one also looks strikingly similar to ours. But scientists didn't stop at appearances, they took things a step further. They CT scanned the bone to analyze its internal structure. Why? Because bones actually adapt over time, based on how they're used. If Neanderthals use their hyoid muscles and ligaments the same way we do, their bones should have microscopic structures that mirror ours. And guess what? That's exactly what they found. This means that, structurally speaking, Neanderthals had the physical ability to produce speech sounds very similar to ours. But hold on, having the right vocal equipment is just half of the equation. The other half? Hearing those sounds. While fossilized hyoids are rare, skulls are not. And thanks to the many hominin skulls we've found, scientists can study the size and shape of their ear canals, sometimes even the delicate middle ear bones. For instance, fossils of Paranthropus robustus, an early hominin species, reveal some fascinating details about their hearing. Their outer ear canal was shorter and wider than a chimp's, making it more human-like. One of their middle ear bones, the malleus, also looked more like ours than a chimp's. But their other two middle ear bones, the incus and stapes, were still more chimp-like. And when researchers modeled their hearing abilities, they found that Paranthropus robustus wasn't quite like us or chimps. Instead, they seem to be more sensitive to mid-range frequencies, a range that overlaps with some human speech sounds, but isn't quite the same. More modern-style hearing appears to have evolved with our own genus, Homo. Fossils of Homo erectus from Asia show early signs of human-like hearing, and by the time we get to species like the Neanderthals and the hominins from Cima de los Huesos, their ear anatomy was almost identical to ours. And when scientists applied the same hearing models to these later species, the results were clear. They probably heard the world just like we do. Over time, our ancestors lost some of the mid-range frequency sensitivity seen in earlier hominins. But in exchange, they gained the ability to hear higher frequencies, a game changer. Why does that matter? 
Well, those higher frequencies are key for picking up consonant sounds like T, K, F, and S, some of the very things that make human language so different from the calls and vocalizations of other animals. And these changes in hearing didn't happen in isolation. They went hand in hand with the transformations in the hyoid bone and vocal tract. Early hominins had more ape-like vocal anatomy, but as we move into the genus Homo, things start looking a lot more human. By the time we reach the Neanderthals and the hominins from Cima de los Huesos, all the physical pieces were in place for producing and understanding complex speech. So, does that mean Neanderthals definitely had language like we do? Well, that's still a mystery. Click on the video on your screen to keep enjoying our content. See you in the next video.